All right, today on the show, I have a guest, Mike Herrera, frontman of MXPX, bass player for Goldfinger, and uh, recently a reality TV star, right? You run uh, Fixer Upper? Yep, yep. That's, that's part of the portfolio now, I guess. Yeah. How's it going, man? Going great. You know, so much has been going on with MXPX, and I'm kind of up to date with all of it, but... I always meet like former fans or old fans and they're always like, man, they're still going. Like it's been 25, no, 25 years was last year, right? Yes. Yes. That's unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy because we all know that there's plenty of uh, people out there that you've never heard of that have like 1.2 million followers. You're like, who is this person? Like no yeah. idea. Um, there's just so much out there to discover if you want to. And and the thing is, is fans of MXPX are always rediscovering MXPX from, you know, yesteryear, you know, whatever, whether it's I just ran across this thing as I was going through boxes of my old childhood stuff. Yeah. Or or something more modern where I just happened to be listening to a podcast where they mentioned MXPX and I went and checked your site and went to the Kickstarter. And it just there's these like epic stories of how they come back. You know, like a <laughs> yeah, like a prodigal son in a lot of respects. Yeah, no, it's cool, and I, I want to talk about the Kickstarter in a bit. Um, but you know, this show is for makers. It's it's primarily for people making software and other kind of digital products. But what's interesting about music? The more you and I have talked, the more I've realized that there is so much, so many similarities between really any business nowadays it's like we're all using the internet to distrib distribute our stuff but before we get into all that i want to i just want to back up because some people aren't familiar with mxpx or you and i want to start at the beginning so uh you were 92 is when you started that's correct 92 how old were you then i was i was 14 15. Yeah, I was I was probably 14 at the time. 14. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was 12. I was born in 1980. You're 78? 76. You're 76. Oh. My math is my math is completely wrong. Um and <laughs> so um how did like how did that happen? You you got together. I think a lot of people know the story, but you met Tom and Yuri. You guys formed this band and the part I'm mostly interested in, because a lot of people do that, a lot of people are like, hey, let's make a band or hey, let's make an app. But you actually got your music out into the world. So how did that happen? How did you guys go from just a band in a garage in Bremerton to actually having people around the world listening to your music? That's a great question. So I, I started playing music with some just random guys that I was friends with and I was singing. And then I saw another local garage band and local shows. And that was the first time when I realized you could actually do this. You don't have to be in a stadium. You can just play music. And so that was really my first thought was, I want to do that. I want to play in a garage with a bunch of other guys. And just that sounds like fun. Yeah. And so it always stemmed from a sense of adventure. And then it's funny because like people would say I was always so serious about the band and about the business and I had equal parts. Um, there was some part of me that was fearless and wasn't really concerned with what other people thought about me and about my songs and about the band. And then there was other times where say like in 1994, we released our first album, Poking at you. We were in high school. We were, it was our senior year of high school and it was released and we're walking down the halls and I have this CD in my hand and I was just like, I can't think of one person I want to tell about this. I kind yeah. of got scared yeah. to like tell the world. And I because you were a little bit like you're self-conscious, just like a high school student. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it took me years later, but once I realized one, people actually did want to hear it, but, but two, that what does it matter anyway? You know, just keep going, keep hmm. going. There's always going to be somebody that's going to reject you. So I think, you know, that's that's how we got out there beyond uh, just 
playing in garages. You know, we took every gig we could. We we worked for pennies. We worked for nothing. We worked for food, whatever it was. And, and we gradually got better. Yeah. And, yeah. It, it, it seems like there's always like um, this certain kind of, you have to break through a ceiling to get noticed. And, you know, with music, it's like you're working, you, you're, you're doing gigs. You're probably, you know, getting in a van and traveling around. Um, but at what moment did you, were you able to kind of break through that, that ceiling and get noticed by, you know, someone who wanted to distribute your music? How did that happen? That's a great question. I mean, we were playing these local coffee shops cause we were, it was all ages. We were too young to get into bars, to play bars. And this is, uh, Bremerton, Washington and the surrounding area. So Seattle, Washington was the main music hub, Yeah, but that was the big city. Yeah. And there was a band called Poor Old Lou from Seattle that came over and played in Port Orchard, Washington, near our hometown. And we went and gave them our tape. And we got to open for them over here. And when Aaron Sprinkle heard the tape, he was like, dude, I'm going to pass this around. We got we ended up getting a gig in Seattle, Washington at a frat house, like a fraternity college house. But all these guys were musicians and they were all jamming. So like we little kids walk into this college party and it was like a record scratched yeah. but we set up our gear and we jammed and we blew the roof off the place and that was sort of the big moment of oh my gosh these kids are doing something that we've only really seen like older people do before yeah um and that was sort of our our, our foot in the door you know it's funny i've done a lot of these interviews and when people go from like one stage to the next, it's hardly ever, you know, like I got this brilliant idea at one in the morning or it's like I met this one person. So Aaron Sprinkle, uh, he was with poor old Lou. Is that right? Correct. And so did he have connections? Like why was that such a pivotal relationship for you guys to get? Yeah, he actually produced our very first record and, and that didn't happen just like overnight. That was a process of, us opening for Poor Old Lou, giving him the demo tape, him telling his other friends in other bands about us and kind of being like, hey, it's cool if, if they come by and play a set at the party, right? Yeah. They're like, yeah, sure, tell them to come by. You know, so like he was definitely a pivotal person. And then he, he was the first person we actually recorded in a real studio with. So we went to Seattle, recorded four songs, and it was going to be a seven inch for Tooth and Nail Records. And when Tooth and Nail heard the four songs, they were like, nah, we're doing a full record. Huh. Let's go. Let's do it. Wow. Sign on. We're, you know, can you guys sign these contracts right away? Yeah. And so, like, we didn't even, we weren't trying to get signed. We weren't submitting our demo tapes to record labels yet. Um, we were just in the scene, in the local Kitsap County scene where Bremerton is. And then we spilled over into Seattle. Yeah. And because of those connections, we got gigs in Vancouver, Washington, or sorry, Vancouver, BC, Portland, Oregon, uh, you know, the whole Pacific Northwest. And then from there, Tooth and Nail had ties to Southern California, which probably is why everybody thinks MXPX is from Southern California. Yeah. That and the, the upbeat sound as well. Yeah. See, I'm so fascinated by distribution. And, you know, you can make an incredible product. But if nobody hears about it, it doesn't really matter, right? And so I've often thought about like how many kids were starting bands in the 90s. Tons of people were stand starting bands. But you guys obviously had something special, but then you were able to get this distribution, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now it was being distributed to a wider audience, an audience that didn't know they needed MXPX in their lives, but they were... Some some were happy to get it. I'm sure others weren't, but yeah, it was it was available. And, and then the funny thing is, is you know, I don't want to get too far ahead, but we eventually outgrew that. It just kept going. There's something about this that is because I was in Stony Plain, Alberta, and somehow, and this is before um, Napster. This is before you could get really music on the internet, and so you had to get CDs or tapes, and you know, MXPX is interesting because the way my friends discovered MXPX was in HMV, Sam the Record Man, all that stuff. 
But the way I discovered it was in a Christian bookstore. I'm not religious anymore, but growing up, we went to this Christian bookstore and there was this huge CD section and it was all like MXPX, Value Pack, all that kind of stuff. A lot of tooth and nail. A lot of tooth and nail. Now, that's kind of an interesting duality that I haven't heard you talk a lot about. You know, how important was that channel, you know, being in Christian record stores? Even I was looking you guys up today and Rolling Stone has you as one of the 50 greatest pop punk albums. But, you know, the first line is MXPX became the rare Christian punk rock band. And so that became kind of one of your channels. And I'm, I'm interested in that. Like, how important do you think that was? How much of a detractor was it? Like, what's kind of the your feel on, you know, being with Tooth and Nail and them having that distribution into all those Christian bookstores? I mean, it, co- it colors some things, not everything. Um, but back in those times, everything was so new and so, like, journalism was very cookie cutter kind of like it is now but in different ways and you always had to focus on something else to give the story you know more value or more likelihood that somebody's going to read into it um and we were definitely i would say victims of that in some ways and and maybe we played into it in other ways but uh, you know it was an eye-opener when when we were doing an interview with spin magazine and after the interview was done, off the record, the, the journalist started talking to our drummer, Yuri, asking him questions about this and that and some personal relationship stuff with not even asking Yuri about himself, asking him about uh, myself or, or Tom. Yeah. And, and Yuri just wasn't thinking and starts talking and it ends up in the article, some personal information that oh, man. we were just like, oh. Okay, so that's how that's the world we're living in. Yeah, and and uh, we we started paying more attention after that to what we said to people. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, I don't want to stay on this too long, but I think it is interesting from a, a distribution standpoint because Tooth and Nail definitely had this exclusive kind of distribution into all these Christian bookstores, and you know, for me. I don't know if I would have discovered MXPX, like it was like MXPX and Crash Dog and all these. And it was like, I hated going to that store until I found this music section. And all of a sudden I was like, man, there's these bands that get me. Um, These bands don't seem that religious. And it kind of gave me an outlet in that time of my life. I know there's something about that that's interesting. And, you know, eventually I think you guys were able to kind of break away from being a Christian band. But early on, do you think it helped like the band get, you know, distribution? Did it help you get in, uh, into the hands of more fans or what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do think it helped. I think anything out of the ordinary kind of helps, right? Yeah. It, it may, That's, you know, you look at what the flagstones of success are in a lot of people's lives and it's when they took a chance or when they did something that stood out. And I think not that being you know in a christian bookstore is taking a chance but i think it is a a different place to find skate punk yeah and for kids that such as yourself that were have found themselves wandering these aisleways of of weird looking old weird 70s looking artwork of bible stories and you're just like this isn't me you know and then you find this music and you're like how is this is so weird and it sticks in your mind in a way that you're like, you found something that shouldn't be here, but I like it, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and maybe that's why you like it even more. I don't know. Yeah. But I think in the, in the same way, like, you know, I was reading some books on marketing and, and there was, uh, Tim Ferriss was talking about putting his book on Pornhub or something like that, like yeah. very unorthodox type, type places to put. Even albums, I think there's been bands that have put their albums on Pornhub, you know, yeah. for, or or uh, or uh, what is it? I can't even think of the name of this thing. It's like um, BitTorrent. Oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I've never been like a super BitTorrent guy, but like yeah. my, my wife, my wife has BitTorrent. I yeah. Don't, so like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Some people give it away for free on yeah, yeah. Like people so people can torrent it. Yeah, and standing it's a strategy. It's yeah. A strategy. 
Yeah, and standing out is a huge thing. You're right. Like, I can remember so many of those album covers just because they stood out. Like, Value Pack had this bright orange, and they had, like, kind of an anime uh, cartoon on it. And I was just like, I remember that album. Is that important still today, you think? Well, I wonder about that. That's what I want to get into that a bit later. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) One of the things I like about you, though, is that you're talking a lot about business lately. And you've got a great podcast called the Mike Herrera podcast, but it's kind of like a mix of like what it's like to be creative in 2018, what it's like to run, uh, be an artist, but also care about, you know, the business side of things. Uh, there's like a lot of interviews with other musicians. It's a really kind of intro you interview folks like, um, uh, ego is the enemy. How come I'm blanking? Uh, Ryan. Oh, Ryan holiday, Ryan holiday. And it's this really interesting mix and it kind of shows kind of what you're interested in. So when did you realize that MXPX was a business? Like at what point did that kind of like, you know, this is a business. When did that happen? Uh, Probably, I'm ashamed to say, probably like 2012. Okay. (laughs) You know, like our first, um, we've done a bunch of businessy things in the past, but uh, we did Plans Within Plans, you know, the last album before that I'm working on right now and we did it ourselves DIY but we hired a distribution company um, on the east coast to, to like kind of take care of stuff and that was the first time I realized nothing gets done unless you actually do it yeah and I think in the past you know I'd been we'd had a lot of management and we had had a lot of different tour managers and, and all, people around you you know it just it happens yeah but as you grow as an adult you find you kind of you spend more and more time alone working on things yourself. And that's when I realized, Oh, this is, this is a business and it's not only a business, it's my business. Yeah. Cause nobody's going to care more about this than me. Yeah. Do you feel like, like do Tom and Yuri care about it? Like a business like you do? It seems like you're kind of like the business guy in the group. I'm the business guy in the group, but Tom and Yuri, I would say the last four years and up and, and it's growing and growing with this new record. Yeah. They've never been more uh, excited about MXPX as a business and a band Mm -hmm. and what we're doing and the possibilities. You know, if we raise more on the Kickstarter, we can possibly go to more cool places like they care about that. Yeah, they they like the idea of winning, you know, (laughs) to put it simply. Yeah. And so, yeah, back in the day when we were just doing our tours, tour after tour, and we're in that cycle. Um, once we were already quote unquote successful and signed and putting out records, you know, it, it does get away from you in a lot of ways. And, and it's easy to let it because there's so much to do. There's so much stimulation Yeah. that, you know, you just concentrate on the playing part. And once everybody, this person's, you know, okay, they need to be fired. That person quit. Mm -hmm. That person slowly just moved on. You know, you kind of find yourself alone. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a great team around me right now. Like, I'm not saying I'm alone, but I think it, it's important to realize that what you're doing at the end of the day should be something that you alone are excited about. Yeah. I, I wonder if younger bands are more kind of savvy about this now. I was, there's a local band here in Vernon uh, called Days of May, I think. I'm going to, I'm going to skewer that, but they've already registered as a LLC. Like they're like, okay, we've got some traction. It's time to treat this like a business. And in the old days, it almost felt like, especially in punk rock circles, that was a little bit of a taboo, but it really feels like that's changed. Like now people are looking at, you know, like Macklemore, he releases the album independently and nobody's really, uh, making fun of them for that. They're all like, this is great. You know, like the idea, even like indie music, part of the indie part is you're a business and you're doing it yourself. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's 2018. It's, it's a beautiful time to be a band or to be a business because you have the internet and you can go straight to your customers. You can go straight to your fans. And, you know, I, I might be a little grandpa in some ways because I feel like, Bands today can be a little too businessy too soon because yeah. it should be about the music and about when it comes down to it, b- good business or not, if you don't have good music or if you don't connect with people, you're wasting your time yeah. or, or you're wasting other people's time. Yeah. And um, 
I feel like some people get too too ahead of themselves with like, okay, I've got a Twitter handle, I've got the Instagram, I've got the Facebook, we have now let's write some songs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's like let's figure out the first. Yeah, the main thing. It's got to be the main thing. I, there's some, the other thing I was thinking about is that if so, 25 years of MXPX. That means in some ways, uh, Tom and Yuri have been your business partners for 25 years. That's a long time for any group or business. So how did that happen? Like, how were you guys able to stick together all that time? What kind of Lessons have you learned along the way? Like, what made that partnership stick? As uh, you know, I've thought about this, and I come up with a different answer every time. Yeah. Um, but there, there's a theme, and that's we're, we're all focused on the same thing at the time, and I think that was that was doing something that mattered, and it always felt like as simple as MXPX was, and still is. Um, we every time we've tried to like Yuri tried to quit or we've done anything differently, people really have an uproar about it. It means they, they care about it. So I think the underlying theme has been family. Like we've treated each other like family. And although like, we're not like super huggy to each other and, and you know, <laughs> like we do love each other in our yeah. own ways. And it, it's just, a lot of it is the years, the 25 years plus going on. But how did we do it in the beginning? That's luck. That's, yeah. that's a lot of things. Probably luck, the opportunities not really being uh, anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, being, being from Bremerton, um, we just felt like it's this or nothing. So let's go. Yeah. It, it's only because sometimes now, if you're looking for a business partner, and I'm sure bands do this too, they're like, okay, well, let's go and let's find some people that meet a bunch of criteria. But you guys were kids and you met, I mean, you must have had some criteria early on. Like, you didn't just um, just take anybody into the band. Like, there, there must have been a vetting process or something. Was there something early on, even when you were a kid, where you were like, okay, I can trust Tom, I can trust Yuri, or do you think it was just luck? No, I mean, Tom was funny, so yeah. he was in. And, you know, it's funny because Tom replaced our original guitar player, Andy. And Andy was in the band because I he was my best friend. And so I told Andy, hey, have your parents rent you a guitar, take guitar lessons, you're going to be in the band. Yeah. And he did that. He rented a guitar for $14 a month <laughs> and, and eventually got it, you know, owned it. But Yuri, the drummer the fact that he played drums was how he got in the band. Like I was calling my friend, Eric. I was like, you play drums, right? He's like, dude, I just switched the guitar. I was like, dude, I need a drummer I'm going crazy over here. Yeah. <laughs> and so he gave me Yuri's number. I met Yuri. The rest is history. He was yeah. the only drummer in town that it wasn't already hooked up with another band. Yeah. Why were you so driven? Uh, you know, I, I was always the kid that was on my bed pretending like I was singing or pretending like I was in the NBA and shooting a basket and had the Nerf basketball. I, I've always been competitive, but I've, I've always been very scattered yeah. in my, my interests. So I like sports. I like music. I like to combine them. I like punk rock, I think is a com combination of the two yeah. when we, pl when we play live and, you know, I like to create things and, and, I like to switch it up. And so being in a band to me, I, I guess in a lot of ways you could say that it's silly because you're traveling all the time and that's very monotonous. Yeah. And I do like my routines, but I've, I was always drawn to not doing one thing for eight hours straight. Yeah. Okay. I want to get into more of the kind of business stuff and more of the Kickstarter, but I want to take an intermission to sure. ask some fan questions. Keenan Kirk wants to know if the artwork for the new album is done yet. That's a great question. Um, it's not done yet, but it's very close. Okay. Very close. That's my honest answer. And can you give us any, <laughs> any teases as to what is it? Is it classic? Is it, what, what's it like? I think it's going to be fairly classic. Okay. In the classic range. That's what I'm going for. Um, John Nissen 
is doing the artwork and he's the original artist of the Pocanacha Punk. Yeah. He did, he did our first album or second album. He's done a, a bunch throughout our history. And so we just felt like everybody loved Left Coast Live. And that was the last release we just did, our live album. Yeah. And he did that. And and just keep that going. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. Okay. So Clifford Oravec wants to know, how many people actually wound up moving to Bremerton? I'm because of the oh, song. <laughs> that's a great question, Clifford. I, I don't have an actual statistic, although there's got to be some. Um, but I've heard uh, I've heard personal stories from. It's got to be ten plus. It's got to be twenty plus by now. Maybe even thirty plus. I couldn't name more than three or four, but uh, a couple of the guys that I work with right now in the studio have all moved to Bremerton and one guy's from Oklahoma, the other's from California. Yeah. So there's just two really close examples. Yeah. It's just like great. Did, didn't the town of Bremerton give you the key to the city or something? We have the key. Yes. Yeah. It's Which was a joke <laughs> <laughs> because, because we were doing a, uh, we were doing an event for the city and they were like, um, is there anything you guys need, you know, special, you know, like a writer or drinks or this or that. And yeah. we're like, Yes, the key to the city. Uh, and they're like, look, look, we'll look into that. No way. And we got it. Yeah. If you I don't mean, ask, for them, it's not received. Well, I know. And for them, that's great. It's great marketing. They've got a song that's on thousands of albums that, you know, all these people are listening to. That's awesome. Um, okay. I've got a fan question. I want to know, what's the story behind the cooties? How did that, I, that was like one of my favorite albums growing up. How did that come about? I always wondered like, I could tell, I, I think it was somebody from 90 Pound West, but like, how did that like happen? What was the story behind that album? Sure. So the Cooties was actually a side project from MXPX and a couple guys in other local bands in Bremerton. Okay. Bands that nobody would know. And later, they be, some of those players went on to, to play with 90 Pound West okay. after being in the Cooties and, and being on the radar yeah. of, of more local bands. But um we did a side project because we just wanted to do something fun with our friends, Giles and, and Eric at the time. And then later on, Dale joined the band and replaced Eric. Uh, but the thing is, is Tom was on drums. Tom Wisniewski, the guitar player of MXPX yeah. was playing drums. I was playing guitar instead of bass. Uh, our friend, G uh, Giles was playing bass. And then we had a guitar player, Eric, and then Dale. So there's the lineup how it happened was we just wanted to do silly songs. And so we put a bunch of song ideas into a hat, picked them out. All right. The beach. Let's write a song about the beach. No, we ended way. Up writing three songs about the beach. Okay. I didn't two know of this. Which, yeah. We wrote three songs about the beach, two of which I think made the album one didn't. Yeah. But, uh, it was just all the songs were about silly things that were really surface schoolgirl fantasy yeah. That was just meant to be, you know, exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I think that was partly the appeal to it is there was no serious songs. Yeah, it was so fun. And some of the some of the music actually was was pretty cool. I, I kind of yeah. liked it. So and, and I sang the songs I wrote. Giles sang the songs he wrote and so on and so forth. So. Yeah. So it's just a way to mix it up, have some fun, do something different. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more fan question and then we'll keep going. Tim Aton wants to know, should I use a pick or my fingers to play bass? You probably get this question a lot. I've been picking, but I see all the pros using mostly the finger picking style. What do you say? You know, that's, that's, uh, depends on what you want to do as a bass player and what kind of band you're in. Um, if you're playing rock music, like on the MXPX side of things, skate, anything punk rock, you can get away with playing with a pick. Um, and if you're playing funk, jazz, slower rock, pop, even pop, you might get away with a pick, but um, fingers, you know, so it's just, it's, it's a sound thing. It's a tone thing. The way that your fingers sound on the strings is different than the way the pick sounds. So it really is up to you. Um, I like a crisp, even sound. And I also, I slammed my fingers in the bus door on a, on a tour across Canada, actually. Oh, no. And, uh, Thanks, Canada. I, you know, some guy reminded me of this, and I, I, I wrote a, a, 
couple tweets up yesterday and I was telling him about my fingers and how I, I had to tape up my hand. And after that tour, I vowed to switch to a pick. So I used to play with my fingers and then I switched to a pick. Oh, interesting. Cool. Well, there we go. That's the fan question segment. I might have a few more of those later on if we got time. Um, back to MXPX as a business. Um, there's one thing I want to talk about. Oh, there's, I have questions about the music business just because it's like I, I'm wondering. I know there's been some changes and it's interesting to me. So I've heard that the way bands used to make money is if you could sell a lot of CDs, that was the best way to make money in the music business. And recently, I've heard that was, that's transitioned into most bands' revenue comes from touring and merchandise. Is, is that correct, roughly? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a transition that happened in 2007. Okay. And, and well, 2007 was 2007 to 2000, I would say 10, was probably the worst time for music because that, that's when the transition was happening. But live music wasn't doing well either. Yeah. So um, very true. Um, we, we make most of our money off of touring, playing live shows, live events. Um, although that may not always be the case, um, yeah. you know, if we do, you know, we do more albums on Kickstarter, that kind of thing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, we're always looking for how to tweak our business models. MXPX is, I would, I would not use our trajectory as a norm for the music business because we're definitely different in the way we do things. What, how are you different? What's what's different? We're much more mom and pop. We're much more DIY than most of the music business where we try to own everything that we release. We try to self-release as much as possible. Um, and that includes live events. Um, we don't do always own our, all of our live events, but uh, some of the shows that we do are completely our own team putting the shows on. We just rent a building or a venue. Yeah. Um, and, and it goes from there all, all the way up to just getting a paycheck to show up to a place as well. Yeah. So, um, but having that fluid sort of business model where we're just, we're, we're doing this industry and this, this niche of this industry and this, like it, it allows us to do a little bit less of one thing. Like we're not constantly slamming all, every city in Ohio once a year, you know, because that's how we need to pay our bills. Yeah. I, I just feel like it's a, a more creative, less, less sporadic way of, of making it work as yeah. a business. And, and in 2000, sorry, you said 2007, was that because MP3s were becoming more popular? Is that, is that what caused like the worst years in music? Yeah, it was just, it was, it was the Napster days catching up with the monstrosity that is the music business and, mm -hmm. and them not really putting, not really putting resources into developing digital strategies yeah. until it was much too late. So you see what you see nowadays is the music business is finally caught up to where it should have been in 2010, yeah. but it just, it, it couldn't figure it out. So, so yes, I guess in a lot of ways you are correct. There's been a shift and it's just finally happened. But I yeah. knew about it a long time ago. Yeah. And, <laughs> I've and been what, waiting. And what did you do? Like what when in those dark times, were you freaking out or were you like right I away? Hustled. <laughs> you hustled? Like what does hustle look like when things are bad? I got ripped off by a lot of people in South America and Mexico, even in the States here. But I did a lot of DIY random stuff. I tried out things. I did private shows. I did solo tours. MXPX did a lot of terrible terrible shows but uh you know we we uh got back from that definitely yeah. once once we kind of like said okay this isn't working this isn't sustainable yeah and, and there's there's absolutely no shame in realizing that well the reason why we didn't do so well is because we just we were trying to play the game up here but we have the resources of a band here yeah once we started using our resources to play the game here our own game yeah. You started winning. Yeah. That's so, I, I, sorry, I got to stay here for a bit. I want to dig into this pain a little bit because I think a lot of creative people can identify that, you know, when things are hard, what do you do? And 
um, you know, at that point, 2007, you've had a lot of success. You've been, you know, you've played to thousands of fans. You've had music videos on TV. You've been on the Vans Warp Tour. And all of a sudden, like, this big thing comes crashing down on you. And then you're trying to figure it out. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting to me that you had, there was a real struggle there. Well, yeah. And, and the thing is, is it wasn't like it came crashing down. It was such a gradual a gradual thing where, you know, we, oh, well, we haven't played that venue in a while. And the, the next time we go back, we're not going to sell that many tickets to that, that spot. You know, yeah. it's like that. It's like, it's, you can't keep up with the, the, you know, going to Boston and doing a thousand people or, you know, we, at one point we did 10,000 people at the hat show yeah. uh, in Boston. 10,000 people. There's no way we can sustain doing that every time we come to Boston. We had a lot of help with that. The radio station yeah. there really was was why that happened. But um, things like that, you know, it's just the whirlwind of once you have all these plates spinning, Yeah. well, you're not going to get back to Miami as soon as you thought. And so then the next time you go there, it's just like it's been too long. Yeah. Like that happens with countries and regions. It happens with the radio stations, you know. So if you play the game like that, you're eventually going to lose unless yeah. you have, you know, the Justin Bieber team or the Britney Spears team or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. So we have our team and we have a great we have the MXPX team and we do awesome. But we don't have the radio station in Miami or this or that because it's just it's too much. Yeah. We can't handle it. Yeah. Um, we do what we can handle, maybe probably more than we can handle. But that's what I've learned is do what. You can always do more than you can handle, but I feel like we don't even think about it. We just say yes to all these things. Yeah. And then things fall through the cracks. And what was the secret? Because you must have learned, you know, I've said before that the biggest enemy of creativity is desperation because it's like then you're just like in the trees and you can't see in front of you and you're you're not thinking straight. You're making snap decisions. And then... It, you can almost get into this pattern where, you know, like for you, it might be, well, we, we played there, but then we tried again and we didn't sell as well there. And then we tried again and we didn't sell as well. And it's the same thing in software. It's the same thing in apps. It's the same thing in any kind of business. You know, eventually if you're, if you're always kind of reacting out of anxiety, it just gets worse and worse and worse and it can become a spiral. How did you guys get out of it? Well, like, was there some secrets that helped you like, step out of that and then build this team and then do it your way? Well, you know, it definitely helped um, finding a good partner, finding somebody that had my back that was going to think differently than me, but also think differently than all the other managers and record label people have, have thought in the past. Yeah. And that's what I needed. I needed that perspective. So uh, when I hooked up with Tom Chichilla around 2012, he's, He's my partner now, but I mean, the, I, we call him the music czar because yeah. he, he, he's my agent and also my manager kind of does like everything that I don't do. Yeah. But we, we together as a team, we get a lot done and then we have our team members beyond that that do a ton. And, you know, that was not easy to build like that is and it's not done. Like it's constantly tweaking and it's constantly things break down, but looking back to i guess the dark years yeah where we were sort of just reacting to things reacting to whether it's an offer to come play here to or here or an you know an answer to a question that somebody that's tr sort of managing us is asking you know yeah um once i just realized okay i need to actually take responsibility yeah for my own band. Yeah. And, and that was huge. It was absolutely huge. And then, um, we started building. Yeah. And, and then the real work begins. Yeah. <laughs> that, that reminds me, there's this, uh, um, Will Smith is kind of becoming this Instagram superstar, like his stories. A lot of people are following him and he's got this big rant that got a lot of traction where he says, you know, the bad things that happen in your life, might not be your fault, right? And that's everything from, you know, terrible personal tragedies to the music business changes. But he says, you better be damn sure 
that it's your responsibility. And as soon as you said that, I was like, man, that's, but you know, think bad things happen. It, things can't just keep going like this forever. And yeah. it seems like the key for you was, okay, I got to take responsibility for this. And also interesting that this, again, the, the same pattern, whenever people make a step up in their business or their life, it's always like key people. So Tom Chinchilla, is that right? Tom Chichilla. Tom Chichilla. Uh, <laughs> he's probably going to hate that I mispronounced it. But um, No, I love it. How, how, did, <laughs> how, how did you meet him? Like what was, and how did you know you could trust him? Well, at the time he was booking shows for the Ataris and he, I've known the Ataris for years, years and years. They, they opened uh, for us, you know, for a while and, and we've opened for them. They've, we've kind of been co-headlining back and forth for a long time. And uh, I was just doing some like solo dates here and there. And Chris also does solo acoustic dates. And it just made sense. He called me up. He's like, hey, I'd love for you to do these dates in the UK with the Ataris. Yeah. And he talked to my guy, Tom Chichilla. And I talked to him, got on the phone with him. And we talked about all this stuff. We started, we started talking a little bit more and more. And at that point, I didn't really have a solid booking agent, you know, somebody that I was like really into. So it was an easy switch. Mm -hmm. And I had him start booking a few things and the rest is history. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's like over time, you build a relationship with someone, you trust each other more and more. And then once you're onto a good thing, you're like, okay, let's, let's do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk about the new album because it's, it's really <laughs> exciting. Now you've launched on Kickstarter and I've seen a lot of Kickstarter campaigns and some of them, you know, they had, you guys set your limit at fit your, your, um, goal at $50,000. And I see some that are just like, they're just chugging along, trying to get to that goal. And you guys right now are just shy of $200,000 US. Um, I was joking before in Canada, it's 251,000. That's a big jump. Uh, wow. I think you guys should record <laughs> it here because that money goes a lot long, a lot further here in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Just cross the border, man. We'll uh, manufacture it. Um, so this is incredible. Yeah. Why Kickstarter? Like, what gave you guys the idea to do it this way? Well, we knew we wanted to do it independently, DIY, no label. And so then it was, well, are we just going to release it and try to, like, be our own label? Yeah. No. And it was pretty obvious that the answer was, we need a fundraise. Yeah. What's the best way? Is it mu Pledge Music, Indiegogo, Kickstarter? Yeah. And, you know, we, we definitely checked them all out and checked out, you know, what you can do. And I think Indiegogo or, or even Pledge Music is, is easier to use in a lot of respects. Yeah. But the idea behind Kickstarter, I liked. I liked the idea of gambling. I've always been a little, a little bit of a gambler. Yeah. Um, and, and Tom Chichilla absolutely was on, on the same page is he wanted to gamble. He likes our backs being against the wall. Yeah. And so, the only funny thing is, is the 50,000 thing was blown past in like literally like probably like three hours we had made our goal. Yeah. Uh, so we probably should have uh, asked for more money. But the idea was always that we were going to hopefully surpass our goal. Although yeah. there was a tinge of like, what if we don't do it? Yeah. We're not going to get anything. That's what I wanted. I wanted that gut feeling of yeah. being nervous. And, yeah. and to me... Every time I release a record, I've got that feeling. Every time we go walk out on that stage, there it gets easier the more you do it. But there is a little bit of that like yeah. weird feeling. Yeah. And you know, one thing I'm learning, I'm 38 now, and it feels like it's taken me forever to learn this, but a lot of my life has been trying to avoid discomfort. And the more people I talk to you like you and the more I just live my life and learn, I'm realizing that discomfort is kind of the key and we shouldn't be trying to avoid it. Like that idea of doing something that scared you and saying, okay, we're going to do this Kickstarter thing. And there's this chance that MXPX looks real dumb, right? We tried yes. this <laughs> and shit, it didn't work. You know, like we raised five bucks. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no one wants a new record. <laughs> no one wants a new record. And you know, you got that fear, right? 
but yeah, I like that fear. I mean, I know it's like I still think it, it's it's best when the shows sell out ahead of time, and I don't have to like worry about selling and all that. But there is that thing where I always wonder if people are going to show up. Yeah, you know, like are people going to show up? Like I, I always thought that back in the day when when it was selling out, no problem. Yeah, you know, so it's just always been with me. Yeah, and you must have had that to go through that again when you started doing solo shows, right? Like, oh, okay. it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. And and the other thing that's interesting about your story, and I just see repeated over and over again, and it reminds me of Ryan Holiday's book, but like ego is the enemy, and when you get too caught up in your own bullshit, um, it it really can kind of affect the quality of your output. Like when it's so much about you and like maintaining like this, you know, I've got, I've got to be number one or I've got to be like, if, if I can't walk into a venue and have it packed, then I'm not going to do it. And that humbling of like, okay, I'm going to do solo shows. I think Billy Corgan's been doing this too. Um, Solo shows. And now like maybe three people will show up. Like, did you go through all that with the solo stuff? Oh Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I was playing terrible venues. Like when I started doing solo stuff, I I went to Australia, I went all over the place, Europe, um, South America. You know, I've got stories of not getting paid, of fearing for my life. I mean, like, yeah. I went by my I went by myself in some respects, and I went with uh, by myself apart from say MXPX guys, like, yeah. and meeting other guys there to do the tour with. Yeah. Um. So you know, I've traveled by myself a lot. Uh, the last 10 years or so, as well as traveling with MXPX. I definitely prefer, I prefer traveling with the guys. Just it's, it's warm, it's easier, it's yeah. less worrisome, but uh, it's something you kind of have to be used to doing what I do. Yeah. It's, but the discomfort of doing that by yourself, do you th- feel like that was good for you to be like, okay, you know, I'm going to try some solo gigs. Who, who, this is new, right? Let, let's see what happens here. Yeah, I mean, I have just enough of an ego to think people want to see me play solo. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it helps, but but at the same time, yeah, I'm constantly, you know, you don't you don't want to second guess yourself when it comes to solo stuff because even if there's five people there, if you're good, they're going to talk about it. Yeah. And if you're bad, they're going to they're gonna be like my Carrera solo is not yeah. was not what I expected. So I treat every gig like it's the Taj Mahal, like I'm playing Madison Square Gardens. Of course, I play to the room. I'm not like thank you, good day, <laughs> in a small room, but yeah. but I do play. I I take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's a good tension there between um, having less of an ego and being like, okay, like I'm here for these people. If five people show up, I'm gonna give them a great show. But also having the confidence, like you said, of being like. But I can do this. Like, yeah. <laughs> like I, I am worth seeing. Or if you're any kind of product, like this product, maybe at launch it only sells to five people. But I know this is good. Like I know this is going to help people. That holding those things in tension and kind of walking the line between them uh, it just seems healthy to me. Like, okay, I'm not going to be too high on myself, but I'm going to be just high enough that this works, you know? I like that balance. I mean, it's it's important to mentally prepare at least for a, for a little bit going into a solo show for me. Yeah. Um, and I don't always do it, say like at private house parties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you know when I'm doing a theater or something, yeah, I try to like go through what I'm going to do because it's a show, but uh, it's not like Broadway where I'm doing exactly the same thing every yeah. time. The stories morph and change and. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not. I don't know. It's yeah. uh, it's interesting to me, and and probably why it. That's another reason why it is, uh, nerve wracking. Yeah. Okay, let's get back to Kickstarter. Forty four percent of Kickstarter campaigns succeed. So there's a lot that don't succeed. What do you think helped you, folks? How did you get the word out? Like, where did that initial swell of support come from? Well, for us, you know, having an audience is everything. And besides having an audience, you have to reach your audience. And and if you have an audience that has come to us from early childhood to late, you know, adulthood, 
and everything in between. We've got a lot of different stories out there. You can lose people very easily. People just, they're with you and then they get distracted and then they're not with you. Yeah. So, so having an audience like we have, um, it's important to have a strategy marketing. You yeah. Know, it's all about marketing and, and making videos for us is our main form of getting the word out. We make little, little, uh, <laughs> I, I guess you could just say just little promo videos yeah. and, and they're always, they're always meant to get you excited about what we're doing, to get you to grab your attention and, and to let you know, Oh, Hey, by the way, you may have been living under a rock or in the real world, as, yeah. aside from MXPX, maybe we're the ones under the rock, Yeah. but this is what we've been up to and flash, flash, flash. Here's a, a quick version of it. Yeah. I think one thing you've done really well is, because 25, I just can't believe, like 25 years just seems unbelievable. To, I still feel like I'm 25. So the fact that you guys have been a band that long, it just seems so odd to me. And one thing you've done well, though, is you've kept putting stuff out. So I think when I started, because there's this, I, I'm sure my story is pretty similar, actually. You know, I listened to you guys in high school a ton. Um you know, saw you guys play live at a bar in Edmonton, kept following you guys. And then in college, you know, whatever, uh, the rave scene came along and I got an interest in electronica <laughs> or whatever. And then there's this time in starting in my 30s where I was like, I wonder what happened to those guys. And um, as soon as someone's asking that question, they're going to go out looking. And, you know, eventually I found like your podcast I found the new albums you'd done. I found interviews you'd done. And because there was something to find, there was something for me to like actually, you know, kind of latch on to. And that seems to be part of the key is, you know, you got to keep, even when it sometimes maybe seems pointless, you got to keep putting stuff out, right? Like the, like for, why did you start the podcast? Was that part of the inspiration? Was you just wanted to have another channel or? Yeah, it was definitely a channel thing. It was something else that I could um, be creative with that seemed a lot less, a lot less, uh, sorry, let me start that over. My, my battery set is on low power mode. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the podcast was something I just wanted to like be creating something once a week, keep it rolling, talk to people, have conversations that I wouldn't just have without being, you know, it's like, it's almost like a, a permission slip to call somebody and talk about things you normally couldn't ask. Yeah. Cause you ever been talking, having a conversation, you're asking them questions as if it's a podcast, but you're just talking <laughs> and they're yeah. like, what are we on a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> this got so real was, serious. <laughs> yeah. It was like two part, it was two parts. Like I, I, I was inspired by other podcasts and wanting to delve into that and see if I could, you know, be interesting enough to, to like ask some questions and talk about stuff and then absolutely being creative, keeping things, you know, keeping the water flowing instead of stagnant. Yeah. My friend, uh, Patrick McKenzie, I think he's the one that came up with this. He said, you know, the key, if you're a maker is to do things like make things, you know, create things, but then you have to tell people about it. And so many creative people seem to have a hard part with part two yeah. So how have you guys gotten over that? Or has that always come easy to you? Like we can just do things and tell people about it. You know, um, I think we've gotten over that. We realize that is truly what it takes to succeed in this business, in any business, not just music. And yeah. then also there's this thing, you know, that's happened over the years as our fans have grown and as, as the years have gone by and, people are a little desensitized to, to business and what, what, what I mean by that is people want you to succeed. They want you to make money yeah. and people have more money themselves. Yeah. And they realize, you know, all the people that don't make money doing what they, what I love them doing are going to cease to do that at some point. Yeah. And so when you buy something, it's a vote. When, yeah. when you, when you go on our Kickstarter and back MXPX, it's a vote for MXPX. It's a vote for your town for us to maybe come and tour there. It's yeah. a lot of things. Yeah. And anyone who has any doubt about this needs to attend an Iron Maiden show once in their life. 
because yeah. you see all these like formerly cheap ass heavy metal fans that would have complained about spending five, 10 bucks on a ticket and they'll spend a hundred bucks on the ticket and then 60 bucks on the t-shirt, right? Like people want to support bands they love. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in a final minutes here, um, I want to know, okay, so first of all, people should go to the Kickstarter. You can go there by just going to Kickstarter, searching MXPX. Is there anything else you want us to know about the Kickstarter in particular? One perks. Of the perks that you want to tell us about? <laughs> well, you know, I would just say that, you know, a lot of people say, look at the number and they're like, oh, you guys don't need more money or whatever. And the, what I'm going to say to that is we're putting everything back into the products and the perks. Like this is not just going to our slush fund account. The more we make, the more places we're going to tour, the more creative we can get with those spots. So instead of like making a bunch of money on the show, maybe we can just go to a city and play, pay, play for a cheaper ticket because we already made so much on the Kickstarter. That's what I'm thinking, like yeah. that, that kind of thing. Also, just having more backers helps us realize who cares about MXPX. If you buy our new record, you obviously care about MXPX or yeah. you're just a really nice person that wants to back us. Yeah. But um, as far as perks go, there's a lot of cool stuff. We're doing things that we haven't been able to do in the past. Yeah. One big example is an MXPX plush doll. Yeah. So it's our, our max, our mascot, the Poconacha punk as a little doll. Yeah. I'm looking at it and right now. It's so good. It's, it's so cool. And it's like, I've always wanted to do that. Finally, we're doing it. Yeah. A photo book. We've never had a photo book before. Finally doing a photo book. It's for your coffee table. It's big pictures. It's all by the same photographer, Jared Scott. He's been with us for 10 plus years. He's gone all over the world with us. And uh, yeah, it's just awesome. So like things like that are, are pretty simple. We're doing some bigger items like uh, party, our house, be there. You can come to our studio here where I am, listen to the record, listen to us play it live. Yeah. That kind of stuff. I think that one might be sold out or, or it's getting really close. The bonfire is another epic adventure to Bremerton, Washington, and we're gonna, you know, drink and have s'mores and play acoustic guitar by the campfires and tell secrets, you know, and tell ghost stories. So, yeah. stuff like those are the big few of the big items. But yeah, I think the photo book, the vinyl stuff is awesome. There's a lot of people that just love to collect the vinyl. The cover is gonna look amazing on the vinyl. I yeah. can't wait. Yeah, yeah, definitely go support it. I think there's something about again if you're in your 30s or your 40s or your 50s or whatever it's fun to reconnect with stuff you liked as a kid and um again like i iron maiden like they've, they've been putting out albums since the 80s and their new album is amazing and so sometimes you're like ah no it'll never be as good as number of the beast or it'll never be as good as life in general or whatever the case is yeah. And the truth is, sometimes it does get better, and it's just fun to be a part of that. It's fun to be a part of the the new stuff, you know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm the same way. You know, I, I collect vinyl, and I love The Descendants, and there's a bunch of bands I love, and I like getting records. I got, just got a Smoking Popes record that I had. I had written a little blurb on the reissue that they did, and they sent that to me. It was like being a kid again, Yeah, you know? It's cool. It's cool. Sweet. All right, Mike, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, where can people find you on the net other than Kickstarter? Um, of course, mxpx.com for any info on MXPX and my podcast. You can go there, click on the right thing. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, all of that is Mike Herrera TD. Perfect.